Welcome. I'm Jonah Dempsey. I'm Sabrina Monarch. We will be talking today about money and the fixed signs. So these signs are including Taurus, Leo, Aquarius, and Scorpio. Sabrina first introduced me to this idea um, at the NORWAC, at the Northwest Astrological Conference, um, where there was much discussion of the various ways of understanding signs and planets, and, and I had never really encountered the idea before, um, which I believe is something you, you came up with, Serena. I mean, I've, I haven't seen this anywhere, that, that the fixed signs are related to wealth, to material wealth and to um, finances. And, and, you know, I'd encountered the idea, of course, that Taurus is kind of your personal wealth or your material possessions. Um, the fixed signs, yeah, being Taurus, Scorpio, Aquarius, and Leo, as you mentioned. And, and I've also encountered the idea that Scorpio is other people's money, kind of money through inheritances, through um, legacies. But I haven't really encountered anything about Aquarius or Leo when it comes to wealth before. So, so what gave you the idea of um, these fixed signs all being related to, to money? How did that come about? Um, well, the squares, we were going to think about them as confrontations. So if you are on the path of thinking about, I think when people are working to make money and they're on this kind of hustle or they have multiple jobs, so they're really, you know, working is a very Taurian. Um, if you want to get out of the hustle of just working really hard, you're going to have to go towards maybe Aquarius and kind of invent some... Um, ingenious way to work less but make more money right mm. uh, leo is going to be um, creative capital it's like making art and selling it um, i think of taurus and scorpio as the yin dimension of making money it's the energetics of it um, the receptivity uh, the opening to it but leo and aquarius is the yang they're both yang signs um, and the soul work is going to come up in Scorpio of kind of getting over these um, blocks psychically to making money. Um, and that's kind of a controversial topic. We come into Aquarius again, that confrontation of us versus them. Is there a mentality of poor people and a mentality of rich people? And even that, you know, that brings up a kind of alienation or um, which is an Aquarian phenomenon mm. and isn't the Aquarius going to kind of be inclusive then I mean could we make it simple and say the Aquarius is a communist or something I mean <laughs> is there a, a sharing of resources of the Aquarius or is that not part of it it is on the one hand but then there can also be the you know we keep to our own quality mm. of Aquarius the elitism the ivory tower yeah, it is detached. I mean, I guess I always associate Aquarius with being so humanitarian, but it's almost humanitarian from the ivory tower or humanitarian in theory or something. I mean, I yeah, I think of Aquarius as kind of the universal commonwealth. And, and you know, in that sense, um, I could see an Aquarius being, you know, all about file sharing and about overturning some of the restrictions to resources in the name of this kind of rebellious spirit of sharing, since the Aquarius is so collective and, and all about sharing, but, but it's also rather impersonal. And this would happen on multiple strata of value systems, because you might have um, at a certain level of economic wealth, the sharing comes in the form of barter and this kind of trade um, lifestyle but then you can have the elite wanting to create um, legislation that, you know, supports the elite and keeps the rich rich. Um, so the the type of sharing can be universal in theory, but it also can be for a specific group of like-minded people. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So s starting at Taurus, I mean, can we say that Taurus is still? in this framework very much about personal resources and kind of your personal belongings and how you 
um, even maybe perhaps how you enjoy your your wealth or how you enjoy your money is that part of it definitely or? and it's going to be about inner resources and self-esteem and part of why it's so important to also consider its opposition to scorpio which is an archetype of transformation is to consider how we might get stuck in our perspectives of our self-esteem or what kind of money we want to be making for example there's you know people can get comfortable um, with where they're at and they don't need to change except um, you know, there can be this kind of pull towards advancing one's circumstances um, deepening one's practice somehow so there's the quality of like richness and wealth and pleasure with Taurus and there's also a stagnation that comes with Taurus that's a really good point that um, I guess if either of these oppositions are imbalanced you know if you are too far far on the Taurus side, then then you're not open to the Scorpionic um, kind of deepening, which requires a certain amount of um, going through, doing the inner work and and doing the soul work and that sort of deepening, which would transform one to perhaps um, even finding more satisfying. You know, it's like Taurus can be kind of lazy. You know, that's at least that's the yeah. idea behind it. Uh, and as you're saying, st- <laughs> stagnation. What, what would happen if you're too far on the Scorpio side? You know, what if someone doesn't have enough Taurus? Yeah. Um, also, these are going to get played out relationally. So if a person is going to an extreme in one, they will attract the, the other kind of like it will, the environment will balance them out. Um, I think Scorpio without Taurus is, um, it's needing to get things, um, versus just having an inner sense of magnetism and a sense of inner resource, which is Taurus. Um, so it's you know needing to use manipulation or power games to extract things. And it's this sense of being constantly um, comfortable with upheaval and cataclysm and destruction and um, you know, like burn it all down. And Taurus is gonna be this cultivation garden stability sense so if you don't have the stability of Taurus and the tenderness and the gentleness and the care for like the physical realm Scorpio is just like endless shedding and um, transformation without constancy so it could also be perhaps um, if you're too much on the Taurus side and you're neglecting doing the kind of Scorpio work internally and it, it comes to you outside as fate you know, you're you're trying to hold on to your job because it's safe and stable and secure, and trying exactly. to hold on to relationships because it's secure, and then the kind of scorpionic aspect is um, happening to you as opposed to something that you're participating in or co-creating. And then on the Scorpio side, you might be going through this deep inner intensity, or as you're even saying, um, in some forms, using manipulation and, and so on, and and the external Taurus, I mean, it seems like the compensation from the environment then would be to almost um, sit you down and, and force you to be more stable. You get stuck <laughs> in something, you know, where you have to do this kind of routine, perhaps, where where the transformation um, isn't, a, you know. So, and also I, I think about Taurus as, um, you know, there's a lot of stigma against materialism in uh in, in you know society at large, and you know one of the things I really like about astrology is that by giving all of these different images of ways of being or different worldviews or different kind of archetypes through the signs or through the planets, it, it's very it's not moralistic. It's very encouraging and encompassing and inclusive of, of diversity right. of perspectives. So you know, I could also imagine Taurus gets accused of being materialistic as if this is a really bad word you know but I, I could see how um, and it, it, it could be true that someone who isn't living out the scorpionic side may greatly benefit from exploring those depths and they might get to this place of stagnation as, as you're saying without the ability to do that but I could also see how there can be a sort of complete rejection of the material which I wouldn't even I mean that, that also might get into Aquarius to a degree I was because, gonna say, yeah, yeah. because Aquarius is very much the aloof detached spiritual ascetic who is removed from the situation and and yeah well just to even think about you know the scorpio correlation with the soul um and how the soul 
finds a body to have its existence. So the soul is naturally attracted to physicality. And we play that out fractally by being attracted to the experiences that we can have with the physical world. So, you know, we, for example, choose a wardrobe that reflects on a symbolic level who we want to become. It's like choosing another body. Um, mm. So the rejection of the material world is kind of, um, I feel like it's more existential. You know, it gets down to, you know, we are here in physical bodies. So what's the point of um, being anti-materialism, which it, it becomes like this Aquarian um, source of alienation, like, oh, I want to be separate from the material realm, or I'm going to create an ideology or a philosophy, a, a crystallized kind of consciousness that is anti against something, to be free from capitalism or to be free from the emotional stress I feel about trying to get material possessions I want. It's, um, you know, this attempt to be free from something versus to, I guess, play Leo with it, to mm -hmm. use it as a creative... Um, self-expression it's interesting thinking of leo as fixed and it's all about play and i usually think of play as so um well not not fixed i mean you usually think of playfulness as kind of unfixing something you know there's a fixed rigid hmm. thing but in a way maybe uh, the fixed the fixity of leo then would be you, you know just this kind of stubbornly holding on to a uh, well you know and, and just just talking again in, in some of the kind of negative ideas and, and again I love astrology because it allows us to embrace all of these different archetypes without making these judgments but just like someone might say oh Scorpio is so manipulative and Aquarius is so detached and Taurus is so materialistic Leo gets accused of narcissism a lot you know and, and I know this um, as, you know, I have a few placements in Leo, and uh, <laughs> and I have Sun in the fifth house, um, which which has a certain resonance or a certain continuity there. But um, you know, maybe maybe there could be a sort of um, self-serving. I mean, if if someone else is very serious, I could I could see how the playfulness and the refusing to take it seriously could be seen as a little self-absorbed or something like that. You know. Um, right. So how does Leo play out? when it comes to money? Good question. Um, it's the sense that we're here to be creators and we can be producers. And so Taurus can be stuck in this pattern of working for someone else and tending to someone else's garden instead of harvesting their own crop. You know, part of the Taurus does get accused of being miserly or hoarding, and that is one shadow potential of Taurus. Um, but there's also this kind of dignity or nobility in owning the um, the land that is being worked and where the crop is harvested. And so part of um, you know, the Leo aspect is going to be the creative capital that a person is bringing to their work um, so that they are um, producing rather than consuming. Leo is very much a producer. It's a creator archetype. And there's a a theory I have that energetically, if a person is accessing their creativity, they also access more wealth and more transformation and uh, more brilliance, Aquarius. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all of these fixed signs have, um, you know, incredible shadow potentials. All of the signs do. But I think about with Leo, um, it interacts to a square with Scorpio, so there's jealousy. So people see someone else shining, and it resonates with an undeveloped potential within them. But instead of recognizing it in that way, they see someone having something they don't think they can have. So there's this kind of um, alienation from that. Of like, oh, that person's rich. They must have, you know, gotten that way from corruption, or they're, you know, clearly not a good person because they're wealthy. Mm. It's these oversimplified jealousy. Right, that's interesting to think about the squares. I mean, we are talking about the fixed grand cross, which is, you know, um, two oppositions that are 90 degrees from each other. So there is, a, traditionally, the squares is a very tense aspect, and the opposition is a tense aspect. And 
and having this tension between these perspectives. It's not like we're talking about the money trying here. We're talking yeah. about, uh, and that might even kind of indicate some of the problem potentials in when it comes to money, how there, yeah, there are these problems of the haves and the have nots and the sort of animosity against those who have, who have money, which, uh, I could see, yeah, the Scorpio having one of its expressions as jealousy, you know, I could see that around Leo, um, the Leo is shining and, and the Scorpio is yeah. kind of assuming that there's corruption, um, there can be a narcissism aspect to wealth, certainly. Like if you um, if you have capital, you can pay people to create the things that you envision. So it's kind of like you know running the show or ruling things based off of you know it's this Leo grandiosity, and so it is going to interact with a person's value system, Taurus. So someone can also have a value system of like community engagement and you know, contributing to humanity, and they're going to do something different with their wealth than someone whose value system is more self-centered. Um, but, you know, then we can also consider what we judge to be self-centered and where does um, someone's creative self-actualization and care into their own process actually influence the world, such as with celebrity, which is uh, Leo Aquarius polarity. Uh, yeah, I usually think of celebrities having having to do with Leo more because I mean at least celebrities in the entertainment industry. But how how is that related to Aquarius? It's uh, the collective consciousness. I think um, celebrities are you know playing out a Leo process where they're shining and they are you know, radiating something, but it's going to alter the whole collective. Like we all. I mean, not we all, but most people on the planet will know these certain figures. So it's like this person is the, um, I guess, symbol that a group of people, Aquarius, mm -hmm. is being influenced by. And um, so at a practical level, if I were to look at these fixed signs in my chart, would you say that... Um, if I have planetary placements in these signs, I mean, are, are those styles of making money that would relate to me? Or would there also be shortfalls where, say I have a lot of planets in Taurus, but not in Scorpio? Is this kind of pointing to the need for the Scorpionic? Or is it really just that, um, I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, is, that, is the idea to be balanced between these or to sort of hone in on our particular styles? I mean, you know, what if, for me, I have a lot of Taurus and I don't have Scorpio, and and does that mean that I'm more suitable um, enjoying my you know material possessions and so on, or or is it going to continually pr crop up that I'm going to have these Scorpio? I mean, I guess I have, maybe I have a Scorpio transit or something. Then it might really come to the forefront that oh, I've been kind of resting on my laurels and enjoying my material possessions, and that whole stagnation of Taurus comes in. I think that the the fixed cross in the chart, whether it's constellated with planets or not, um, they will be in houses. Um, these can be areas of the chart to pay attention to as like points of crisis and great character when it comes to making money. Um, I think of you know a lot of these spiritual teachings about how we attract what we vibrate. This is a scorpionic concept um, and Taurus would be the inner reality so if a person wants to start making more money and really change and transform their physical circumstances there's a lot of soul work that's going to go into that and that's Scorpio in your chart and it's like really examining the you know depths of your complexes and karmas um, and so there's that aspect of it. And then Aquarius is going to be deconditioning. So, you know, there's a lot of deconditioning that comes along because we have a lot of, um, I think there's something traumatic about money in terms of have you had a past life of starvation? Um, did you grow up not having very much? It creates these repetitive thoughts of like, oh, I have to hoard my resources to be safe or to have enough when, you know, famine comes. And so to deconstruct from these fears that are based off of a soul memory, Aquarius, um, 
you know, is Uranus and Aquarius work in the chart? Well, that was something um, really fascinating to me when I, I began learning uh, evolutionary astrology because I, you know, have a background in more classical Western astrology where the associations of Aquarius, well, t- traditionally with Saturn, but then, of course, um, the last hundred years plus, it's been very much co-ruled, but even primarily now, it seems like the psychological astrology looks at um, Uranus and particularly looking at Aquarius through this Uranian lens of um, the common associations being rebelliousness, revolution, um, you know, uh, Richard Tarnas, the, the great, um, uh, he, he's one, I think he's the first one who really made the association that, that uh, Uranus fits better with the Prometheus um, archetype, so that, that Prometheus was this figure who rebelled against the gods to kind of share the wisdom of the gods with, with humanity and hence the whole humanitarian aspect of Aquarius. And then um, in evolutionary astrology, we find that it's it's a trauma signature. So could you just talk a little bit about that and, and how that works and what the... Sure. They're um, connected. If you think about any time in your life that you've experienced shock or just like this kind of radical traumatic experience, it does create space for new ideas. Um, so they, they can be related in that way. Um, in evolutionary astrology, it does relate to trauma and it also relates to brilliance. Um, mm. That's an interesting connection because, yeah, traditionally, I mean, I could definitely see brilliance, epiphany, um, even at the physical level, the firing of synapses in the brain, <laughs> uh, eccentricity. I mean, these are all kind of traditional associations, but then to kind of look at how, I mean, it's maybe it's a trope, but there is an idea also that a lot of really brilliant people have, have suffered great traumas and have been able to transmute that traumatic experience in some way. Right. And couldn't brilliance even be a form of trauma? Think about, like, uh, just Beauty and the Beast. They just, you know, remade that so it's in the collective consciousness a little bit more right now. Um, It starts out with Belle feeling alienated from her community because she likes to read books and people think she's strange for that. Um, You know, to, to go really deep into the intellect, even if it's you know, a really profound and like worthwhile pursuit, there is this initial separation from the tribe, from the community um, that can be really traumatic to be deeply misunderstood or to be persecuted even. I see, I see. And um, no, that's, a, that's a really good, that's a really interesting connection. So, so in a way, um, bringing it back to money, then Aquarius could represent you know, our own traumas around money, as right. you're saying, uh, the traumas, the soul memory or traumas of early childhood of, of traumas around not having enough, but it can also represent our brilliance or not necessarily the places we shine, which would be Leo, but the places where we can bring in something new, even something eccentric that alienates us to a degree, but a novel way of making money or a novel service or a novel, um, you were saying earlier that that's where we can really come up with an idea or a, a flash of brilliance that, that is, it's, it's different than Leo, for instance, which would just be really shining and showing our gifts and kind of being center stage in the spotlight and, and doing something that, um, really showing off how we shine it's showing off being a part of it as well. And then with Aquarius, it's much more something even unusual or not part of the collective that is in the process of being collectivized if it's successful, you know, in a way. Like like maybe uh, a totally new technique or a new modality or a new job that didn't exist before. And there's always the chance that someone will just say, oh, you're a freak, you know, <laughs> or oh, you're, you're not... Uh, that." Right, you're, it's so it's kind of always on that line between eccentricity and uh, the possibility of genius or the possibility of a, a really brilliant expression. Right. Um, this was also I was getting a flash of um, the phenomenon of changing one's level of income, also changing one's friendship circles, 
um, or just the kind of discomfort of like, you know, I want to do this thing and you invite someone and they're like, oh, I can't afford it. But it's not like an easy exchange sometimes. There's this kind of like jagged Scorpio edge, like, oh, I can't afford it. And it's because there's a lot more going into it psychically than just like this matter of fact, like, oh, you know, not this month. Um, and that's kind of where I feel money and resources tourists becomes alienating because it can bring people together if they have a like-mindedness about it, but it can also separate. Hmm. That's a, that's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, um, and if people treat you differently or, you know, there's always these stories of someone who, who became famous and then suddenly, you know, they're not sure if someone wants to be their friend because of who they are or if it's for a reason. I mean, I, I could see the, the scorpionic aspect of being paranoid that someone's trying to manipulate you to get your resources, <laughs> but also I could see the, the kind of Leo aspect of wanting to be appreciated versus who you are and, and, and both of these being opposed. It, it's, it's interesting. I mean, um, you even hear about people who become famous and I guess they're famous as entertainers in this classic Leo theme. And then they suddenly become known in the collective and they feel alienated from that same collective where they, you know, they're always wearing dark sunglasses and hoodies when they go out, they don't want to be recognized <laughs> or they feel like they've lost the ability to just be appreciated for who they are because they're always appearing as a certain character they played in a film or they're always associated with, you know, whatever it is that they created. So, so I can see that there's a lot of, of inner turmoil on that Leo Aquarius axis as well. So do you have any um, advice for, if I were just to look at my chart, you know, I, 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 have, um, I have placements in Taurus, Leo, and Scorpio, and then I have the Midheaven in Aquarius, but I don't have any, any planets there. But what, what would you look at in particular as just kind of a, and I understand that, you know, every chart is unique and there's so many interactions between the, between the different aspects of the chart, but... But if I were just to look at my chart and, and kind of think about my own relationship to money, what would be some of the things that I would look at and think about? You know, I mean, to give an example, I have um, Moon and Taurus. And so with Moon and Taurus, how would that, could you talk a little bit about Moon and Taurus and how that could be seen through the lens of my relationship to money? Yeah, let's include its house placement yeah, in, um, my, in my case, it's the 12th house. 12th house, okay. Yeah. And then, where? so Leo, in your chart, what are the planets in the... I have Venus and Mars in Leo. Fourth house? Fourth house, that's the fourth house. Okay. Um, and then your Scorpio? I have Saturn in Scorpio in the sixth. Okay, no. just mapping this out in my head. And then Aquarius Midheaven. So the Midheaven is a pretty significant placement, even though it's not um, a planet. It's still um, an angular point in the chart, and it's kind of how you emerge as a public figure. Um, so, I mean, even the, you know, broadcasting ideas, um, intellect, is the Aquarius Midheaven. Um, so the Taurus Moon, to answer your question, um, this would be an interior experience of self-worth. Um, Bentino Mazzaro, who's a philosopher and spiritual thinker that I'm really fond of, um, talks about the concept of meditating on infinite self-worth, just to see what happens. Because um, it would actually radically deconstruct a lot of our ideas of self when we think, oh, I'm infinitely worthy. So anytime we notice that we don't think we can have something or we don't think we can be something to just check that and be like, no, I'm infinitely worthy of love. You can even as a Taurus um, moon or any kind of Taurus or second house placement, or it's even just a Taurus principle to um, plant your feet into the ground and meditate on belonging, um, meditate on abundance. It's kind of like connecting your roots um, into the earth, this kind of rich soil source of life. Um, and to just get really comfortable 
a lot of our, um, you know, fears around not having enough don't involve a sense of deep comfort and deep belonging and deep worth. Um, and it's not to say that, um, how do I put that? Like the trauma of not having enough can go really far into a person's self-worth on a cellular, you know, karmic level where you might not know like, oh, I have this trauma about famine in a past life. So I'm always kind of trying to hoard. Um, but interestingly, focusing on self-worth can unwind some of those deeper traumas that damage that self-worth. Mm. And, and with the moon, um, so the moon in particular, because I understand, so in, in my understanding of Taurus, Taurus can be self-worth, absolutely. You know, if you have um, Chiron in Taurus, there's the classic interpretation that it'll have something to do with self-image issues or body issues or something like that. Um, so I know that in in the kind of psychological Western astrology that I learned, moon is considered it's related to the body, but it's also this kind of psychosomatic, um, I mean, it's nurturing, it's all these things. Could you talk a little about how you understand the moon? Because I know in, in evolutionary astrology, it's something, it's more like the ego, isn't it? Right. Which is an interesting idea. It, it can kind of encompass both because it's the ego, um, but it's the perception of self as well and that is the ego whereas the sun in evolutionary astrology is like a sense of isness um, emanating radiating the moon is the um, internal perspective of self and the identifications so would it be also that in my self-identity i kind of naturally identify with the taurus qualities and maybe even expressing itself through 12th house also and those themes right it could speak to even a cultivation of ego um i think that we have this concept of the ego being like a bad thing and like you want to um like transcend the ego but if you think of it um so i think of the ego as like a car <laughs> that the soul scorpio is driving um, so to actually consider your incarnation as a vehicle to be a steward of and to take care of. And so if you cultivate the ego without having a spiritual perspective of self or an identification with the soul, I think that's where the ego becomes something that you need to transcend. But once you've already done the spiritual process of like, you know, realizing that there's more than you know, just our own world, that there's something else beyond, that there's something deeper. Um, cultivating the ego can be an act of um, intentional stewardship of life. Mm. And Taurus is very much about gardening and cultivating and this tenderness. So it could be a, a conscious value of the incarnation that you're in. Mm. And then with the 12th house, it relates, I mean, I always understand the 12th house as kind of hermitage. I guess there's many other associations of it as well. Would it be that um, I'm most able to cultivate my ego and my sense of self-worth and self-identity when I'm somewhat remote or when I have a, a solitary reflection or an introspective time? Is that is that kind of part of it? or That could definitely be a manifestation. Um, the 12th house relates to some kind of withdrawal. Um, so it could be a very literal one, like you actually are taking space from the rest of the world, but it also could be a perceptive withdrawal, like being very aware of the quality of witnessing reality versus just being in it, which sounds Aquarian, but it's also a, a Piscean 12th house. Hmm. So with Saturn and Scorpio, I, I know traditionally Saturn is associated with limitation and with constriction and things like this. Um, how would you interpret Saturn and Scorpio through the lens of money or, or the relation to the material? So Saturn and Scorpio always strikes me as really deep work. 
like going to the root, the foundations um, and transforming them from that really deep place so that the structure of reality can actually shift in accordance. So in terms of money, um, it could be about transforming your structural reality to accommodate the value, moon in Taurus, um, that you're seeking to cultivate. And so seeing if the way, you know, these greater decisions you make in life, um, the way you spend your time, the kind of boundaries you set, if they're supporting your desires or if they're, you know, addictions or compulsions based off of, you know, just a, a general soul pattern. So it would be a self-awareness. And the, is, is compulsion also a scorpionic theme then? I mean, that's what I usually associate that. So, and that's really interesting thinking of Scorpio's transformation and change and then Saturn having the idea of it being structure and the structures of reality and, and very much um, the, the need to, like, it wouldn't be enough to do a kind of superficial pass over, you know, if I really, <laughs> if I really want to... Uh, you know, help to kind of actualize the, my desires through moon and, and and tying into the the idea of developing self-esteem and self-worth and and my own internal values through Taurus that's that's going to require sort of evaluation of or massive overhauls at the the deep um, and yeah yeah deep and commitment to that too mm. just Saturn it's Saturn absolutely commitment uh, you know it's, it's yeah yeah, it's interesting. It's like if we don't commit within Saturn, I think we experience Saturn more negatively. Like it's like all these restrictions, um, all these external blocks. Um, but if we commit to our path and our work, then these, you know, blocks or restrictions become things that we work with versus a constant kind of like retribution from Saturn. Um, we stop feeling punished by Saturn and start feeling... Um, like we have a companion on those those arduous journeys where, where you know we actually do find some satisfaction in a, a job well done and, and right. sticking through something and, and so yeah. here i mean to think about your moon and taurus if your work was something that you didn't value it would be harder to commit to that work i see uh, yeah absolutely with the value system of, of taurus and, and wanting it to be something I enjoy or something pleasurable or, or even I kind of immediately thought of satisfaction. It's almost, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm more on the Taurus side. So I say, yeah, well, if it's satisfying, I can commit to it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. And yeah. I mean, that's going to, um, you know, maybe some of the Saturn conditioning is, you know, work hard and kind of suck it up if you don't like it. Um, but the moon as opposed to Saturn is going to show us that, you know, we should value Moon and Taurus, um, our emotions, because they might be a guide for what kind of work is truly right for us. Um, so it could be a way of loosening up the negative conditioning of Saturn as well to pay attention to satisfaction. I just thought of how changeable the Moon is, and I wonder if, you know, I know that depending on the the moon placement oftentimes um if it's in the seventh house there'll be this idea of of a sort of changeable hot cold thing with relationships or if it's in the 11th house it might be changeable friend groups i'm thinking now can we extend that if it's in taurus it, do, it, well a few things one would it be a changeable value system or a value system where sometimes one thing seems very important to me and other times it doesn't seem as important but also would it even relate to a changeable material possessions or changeable relationship to those material possessions and if if there's a you know it's almost um i mean i i guess i guess it's if the moon is is about my own self identity and my my relationship to my self identity and then being in Taurus having to do with my value system and my identity being wrapped up in my personal values and that those being important to my sense of identity. I'm, I'm just wondering also, um, yeah, how that, that, no, it's a really interesting frame to look at it through. I think that, um, Taurus has a inertia quality, so it could be changeable, 
but there's also going to be this buildup of inertia so it can be an emotional stagnation that comes with moon and taurus if you're not living according to your values and it can be this like ongoing kind of like rising tide of pleasure with moon and taurus um when there's gravity and inertia put in that direction um I think that Taurus also relates to, you know, a body at rest stays at rest. So it can be like these, um, you know, slow startups and then really, really steady continuities with Moon and Taurus. It is the, the exaltation, which, you know, I can see how in, in many ways the fixity of, of Taurus offsets the traditional changeability of, of the Moon and stabilizes it to some degree. So how would you interpret if, um, so if I have, the, so I have the MC in Aquarius, the Midheaven, but I don't have any planets there. So and as you're saying though, it's, it's a crucial point regardless of what, what placements, but in terms of how I, how I relate to Aquarius with, with making money, I mean, it's, it's interesting to speaking personally, kind of taking off the astrological hat for a moment. You know, I, I've worked in technology almost my whole life. And, and I am thinking around how technology has been my primary source of income, working as a software developer, working in various capacities with technology. So I'm thinking about, you know, is the, is the MC in particular, because of course Aquarius is, is always related to innovation and to new technologies. Is the MC sort of a privileged place for career? For I mean, I, I know that um, it is traditionally considered that, you know, the MC and the 10th house have to do with career. So is that sort of also where you want to look? Like, if you happen to have that in one of these money signs, is that going to really accent that particular sign as a mode of, of making money for you, or is that more a peculiarity of my chart and that might be totally different for somebody else? I mean, I guess what I'm wondering is if my MC was Leo, would I have much more of a focus, you know, <laughs> on Leo or if it, and then, you know, what happens when the, the signs, when the MC doesn't fall on one of the money signs? I mean, that's another interesting question to me is, is how do you synchronize or not? I think that having the fixed signs and the angular houses will create, you know, it affects where this money cross is happening. So for you, it could happen along um, first house, like initiating new impulses, uh, seventh house meeting new contacts. Um, there's going to be a connection. I mean, Aquarius is already about networking, but to have this angular Aquarius, it's also going to bring in seventh house. Um, the I see Nadir, Nadir and the Ascendant. Mm. So, I mean, for me, I have my mutable signs in, or my fixed signs, I mean, in mutable houses. So I feel that, you know, the fixed cross feels so um, almost dense and kind of heavy to me, but because it's in mutable houses, I'm always shifting them. So I can do really quick soul work, <laughs> like really quickly meditate and like, um, kind of shift my frequencies, um, unravel certain um, thoughts and create new ones. And it can be these really quick transitions of like changing my mood. My moon is also in Taurus and it's opposite Pluto. And I can change my mood on purpose and go outside and everything's different all of a sudden. And I have different experiences and it can happen in a matter of minutes. So that's what it feels like having these fixed signs in the mutable houses. But on the angular ones, um, it's going to have more of that energy of startup um, and kind of confrontation with other, confrontation with new creation. That cardinal theme, right? Um, well, so I just had the thought, and this might not relate too much, but it is interesting that Pluto means riches that Pluto actually means riches. And it's an interesting idea that, you know, that might just be more of a deep connection between the idea that our own personal depths and our own 
even um, sometimes overlooked or rejected aspects contain the riches, really. Uh, the soul is so rich, and the soul projects itself onto other things. Um, it, which is where it impoverishes and disempowers itself. Um, you know, so everything that we see, everything that we observe is actually part of the soul or else we wouldn't be able to comprehend it. Um, so what happens is that instead of seeing that everything we can see is also part of us and therefore part of our own soul, we think we get into this Taurus lack thing when we see something outside of ourselves. Um, but one thing that kind of changed my perspective on this was the mythic tarot deck with Liz Green's interpretations. And every single face card included an interpretation at the end about, you know, this can be an augur of, you know, this quality developing within yourself. And if you meet this person externally, um, that's also a sign that you are ready to develop that quality within. And before that, if I met people that I really admired, I would feel more jealousy, I think, or feel like, oh, I could never be like them. And it kind of made me want to hermit up and just like, oh, I can't even deal with the psychic pain of this jealousy. But then I started to see that the things I came into contact with, the people that I came into contact with were actually part of my own vibration and part of my magnetism, um, which made my relationship to the world a lot different. I know that can sound weird to say like, oh, you know, talking about your magnetism, there can be that Leo narcissistic quality, but this is, you know, also something to work through with, um, I, follow, I, it, I follow it completely. It's it's if somebody is on your path and if you happen to meet them, instead of yeah, I mean that's a really interesting point you're saying from Liz Green that that really it's life telling you that you're ready to explore or to embrace or to embody some of those characteristics yourself, or that at least you have the option to. It's not simply oh they're so successful and I'm not or however you want to look at it or they're doing something really exciting and I you know my job is boring it's much more oh you're you're meeting people who are excited about their jobs or who are excited about you know and whatever it is their their careers their their modes of expression um, and that's really empowering that that you are being shown an example so that you might also be able to embody those characteristics right and so I think that that's actually happening all of the time and that without really engaging in just like a study of what the soul is and defining it, um, it's so easy to project the power and the riches of one's own soul onto the external environment um, rather than recognizing it's always been within. Um, and then there's also the asteroid psyche. Um, which is, I don't have the figures for how far away it is, but NASA was speaking of a trip to go excavate or explore Psyche. And this article was saying that Psyche had metals on it that were worth like something like 350,000 times the Earth's economy combined. And I just thought it was a really great symbol that the asteroid Psyche is considered to be this place of such like riches. And then, um, someone from NASA was quoted saying something like we explore outer space to learn about inner space because apparently psyche uh, resembles a planetary core <laughs> and the, like psyche yeah. is the core and so I thought so what if this imagery also relates to internally where we have to travel really far to find psyche like you have to dig um and same with like NASA, they have to go on this epic mission to find Psyche. But once you get to that core, and Psyche being this core of a planet as an asteroid, um, there's just complete riches. Um, and I think that, you know, in the case of this projection of the soul externally, if all of those things can be found on the inside, it's like no longer having to seek or to get, it's just already being, already having. Yeah, so that's a really good point that it's, um, 
realizing that you know you, it's it's finding within yourself those those resources that you need or the because there is you know and as you were saying with the soul projecting outward there's oftentimes i mean this is kind of one of the fundamental psychological insights of the last 100 plus years is really this idea that we are often chasing something that's a substitution for what we're really yearning for inside so we might be looking for some external expression that's almost it's just a metaphor or it's a substitution for for something internally that that we feel we're lacking but we're not lacking we just haven't um, done done the kind of inner work to discover that in ourselves um, I mean at the same time, we have to be careful not to imagine that that it's only psychological. Um, there was a really interesting point um, that was shared by the uh, Jungian analyst Marie Louis von Franz. She had a a priest who came to her who was was celibate, and he had fallen in love with a, a woman who lived in the town, and he asked von Franz what he should do. And this is you know very similar to being an astrologer when where really you are you are doing soul work it's the same thing whether you're doing certain modes of psychoanalysis or therapies or whether you're doing astrological readings it's it's soul work and people come to you and they bear their soul to you and they they have these crises of soul and and there can be this thing of asking what do i do and i mean of course you you can't tell them and so von franz said well if you you know, because this priest had, had read a bit of Jung and he understood, you know, is this woman I fell in love with just a symbol for one of the faces of God? And is it really, is it really that I, in, I shouldn't leave my faith? I should just deepen my relationship to God and, and deepen my spiritual faith and have this sort of inner experience? Or is this telling me that I've been too afraid to really touch life and be in life? And that you know, I, I need to have the experience. And well, she said, well, either way, you're you're going to be giving up something. If you have the inner experience, you're giving up the outer. And if you have the outer, you're giving up the <laughs> inner. And and it's they're very different. And and nobody can really tell you. You have to discover for yourself which is called for. And it's very much a case by case basis, where sometimes the way forward, or the way towards soul growth, or towards even if you think about it, like if you've had trauma and you've had this sort of fracturing or splintering, I always love the image of um, after Osiris has been killed by Set and he's been scattered into all the pieces and Isis is looking along the you know riverbank and collecting all the pieces so she can put them back together again and, and create Horus, which is the sun, but also this sort of new personality or new... Um, mode, the reconstructed soul, the healing from that fragmentation. T to heal, of course, means wholeness. The word healing comes from the same, same root as whole, H holing, you know, be becoming whole. And um, so I always think of this image of Isis gathering up those pieces. And, and so when you have that soul crisis, the question is really which part of you is lost and which, what <laughs> part of the soul, how, how do you retrieve that? People talk about soul uh, retrieval. And you know, is it retrieving that lost part by having the outer experience or or the inner experience? And it's going to really depend on, on who you are and, and where you are in your life. Uh, I think uh, that's a that's great that you bring that up. The internal and external are basically the same, but which one is more open? Where is the opportunity? And that's my immutable uh, fixed sign speaking, where it's like go towards the the opportunity. But I think that you know an example that comes to mind is cultural fragmentation, cultural traumas, where do you tell people that are suffering um, collectively because of a social system? Well, just do soul work, <laughs> or do you? fix the system that's causing the pain um, and it can be the same with life where it's like you can um, you know forget about your circumstances detach from them like go into an empty room and meditate and reach nirvana or you can change your circumstances to live a more satisfying life um, and I think that in certain situations it almost like the word appropriate is coming to mind where it's like, is it more appropriate to do the soul work and to go within? Um, 
or is it more appropriate to address the external circumstances that are creating an emotional feedback loop back to the internal experience? And that that's very much has to do with kind of the relationship to money also. I mean, it's, I don't have enough money. Well, is it my attitude or is it, and it really, really there is no, there is no clear answer 100% of the time because if you just say, oh, it's always one or the other. No, it's not. It's very case by case. And, um, you know, I, if I feel that I don't have enough money, either I can change my attitude or I can change my access to resources. And, um, and so, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, um, it is absolutely true that, that we can't just only metaphorize and make it a metaphor for, oh, I feel like I lack the resources, but it's really only my inner resources. At the same time, if I don't have access to those inner resources, then it doesn't matter. I might be completely compensating by surrounding myself with physical wealth for a, as a compensation for this deep sense of inner impoverishment. Right. And there's the quality, I think, as well of um, if people have enough, like their government or it's like children with parents, whatever, you know, external figure is giving people money and resources that actually does give time for the consciousness to gestate with this feeling of having enough and you know that's a necessary part of development so to not give someone enough but then to say that they need to just dig into their soul and find it is it's kind of um you know there's a conflict there i think there can be magic in working both the attitude on the soul level and the tangible actions in the material world so, you know, working on your attitude about money, but also getting like a side job that you have extra time to do and, you know, making more money or getting more creative about your gigs in the world. Um, yeah. And, and just realizing that there is no one way. And I mean, really, there's many different ways to make money, but it is nice to think about um, even just kind of the fourfold split between the fixed signs as giving us broad strokes of different types of resources, different, I mean, it's simultaneously different avenues for acquiring resources in the sense that Aquarius might acquire resources through some inventive, some new invention or some innovation, and Leo might acquire resources through personal expression, and Taurus may acquire resources through cultivation, and Scorpio through um, doing this, this inner soul work that allows one to really uh, get to the, the, the deep, the depths of, of what one's soul really wants in a way, or to kind of maybe even kind of, you know, align your priorities with, with what um, helps to, to individuate it's this kind of idea to become more, more attuned to your potential and what the soul's potential is. Um, and so it's simultaneously these avenues for acquiring resources while it's also perspectives about what is a valuable resource. I mean, for Taurus, it's going to be, do I have things that bring me comfort? And, and for Leo, it's going to be, do I, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, perhaps, you know, do I have things that allow me to express myself? Can I express my purpose yeah, in this I way? Am I being a creator? Right, am I right. bringing forth my nobility and shining? Exactly. And, um, and I even, I always kind of think of Aquarius as the philanthropist, not to say that Leo can't be. And it is funny thinking about Aquarius as also having an elitist side. I mean, maybe the Aquarius-Leo axis is always kind of, you know, tarrying with, with these, these complicated themes. But I, it is, it's interesting to see that even the perspective of what is wealth or what is a valuable resource will depend very much on which perspective you take and that what's valuable to Taurus might be very different than what's valuable to the, the other signs. And with Aquarius, it seems, you know, what's valuable for them is freedom, <laughs> you know, or right. valuable to the Aquarian is to be, to have And isn't the that what to... money is defined by a lot of people? It's the freedom sure. to travel or buy things that they want. Um... The freedom to be your own boss or to not have restrictions put on your time in certain, certain cases or to have the freedom to, um, absolutely, absolutely. Whereas, you know, Taurus might define it more in terms of security or something and being safe is almost like, well, yeah, I, I have to work this nine to five job and I've made this agreement and so on, but, and I've given up certain freedoms, but I have the security and the stability. And the, so it's interesting how, um, 
even what what is valued by the signs is very different. It's not just that everybody wants to, I mean, obviously we all have all four signs and we all have transiting planets, whether or not we have them in our natal charts. And so we're all experiencing all four of these, but you can absolutely see how um, certain, certain people tend to embody one or the other, or the same person may embody one more than others at different times in their life. And we may, yeah. Yeah, I think, um... I also want to bring in the nobility of the soul piece with Leo, um, which I think can be a gateway out of limitations that appear with Taurus, because Taurus can get really stuck in just what's happening in the physical and material plane, and so it can be this nine to five job and like, yeah, this is just my life. But Leo has this sense of grandiosity and inner nobility, and will want to see that play out on the material plane. So I think that in a sense to transform to transform one's experience um, it's not just even a matter of self-worth but that kind of vision and fire from Leo that says like I'm here to create and manifest my inner nobility Leo just knows about its own nobility it doesn't have to you know it's not questioning its inner values it knows its value it's, <laughs> it's questioning how it how it can best express it or how it can uh find the stage it's almost the question becomes where is the stage yeah um and and how do i have access to that hmm well this is a a really fascinating topic um i'm I'm really excited i mean as i said before i've never encountered this idea before i've certainly thought about taurus and scorpio in relation to wealth but i've never tied in the the Leo Aquarius axis and now that you've pointed it out it, it makes perfect sense that these are all four very crucial aspects to our relationship to resources and and to um to money and and you know and and it's it's an it's an important part of what it is to be human because in some ways money is a quantified time i mean it's almost the materialization of time it's a way that that time can can be put into the material and so if you buy a resource or sorry if you buy a a good i could say um you're you're paying in your own time that you've put into creating a resource for someone else and then they have this resource for you and, and it, it could be a good or a service or um it, it's such an interesting aspect of you know and I've, I've always thought about how would a world without money look and how would uh you know, and, and these are interesting questions, but but one way or another, we are we are going to. It's almost time is going to express itself physically in some way or another, whether it's it's the work of art that the artist labors over, or whether it's a service such as an astrological reading or a therapy service or, or you know anything at all. There's a labor that that you that that goes into the creation of something that then becomes a resource for others and becomes something valuable to them. And it seems that whatever form the, the future holds in terms of whether we could imagine a post-monetary barter, you know, I mean, however system, there's so many different ideas for post-capitalist systems or different, different ways of, but one way or another, time will find a way to kind of be material or be expressed in the material and we're going to have some some relationship to that we're always going to have a relationship to that it's it's kind of a, a universal factor there's uh that reminds me of a saying within evolutionary astrology with pluto and scorpio that there's no way out but through and so when i think about um the concept of someone avoiding using money or making money because they have this utopian vision of a post money society i think there's no way out but through <laughs> like you have to play uh with what's happening and you know be tender and loving towards that to get through it um when we psychologically as a collective evolve to the point where we don't need money if that's you know somewhere that we get to um that's going to be the fruit of like deep soul work on the collective's part. Um, it's really, it would be hard to skip that, but it's an attractive (laughs) piece of imagination, but you know, it's also very detached from what's happening right now. Well, yeah. And I absolutely agree. And I, I think also, um, 
thinking about, you know, a lot of the problems with money have to do with competition and this sort of strategic mindset of using guile and using strategy to outsmart the the competitors, the the you know opponents, and so on, and to trick the consumers, to, and to trick people, and so on. And it, it does seem like, at, at least um, in my lifetime, I've seen a shift. It, it, you know, it's a shift of the level of consciousness, but it's also expressed through things like the internet and the sort of visibility we all have into practices and this burgeoning awareness um, of of this sort of change towards. Uh, not it's really we've we've moved i mean there's still many problems that obviously there's tremendous competition and there's many problems of 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 things like that but but it, and i'm not saying that cooperation is even the opposite of competition um what i'm thinking is almost that that we are moving towards a, a place where each and every one of us has a unique resource that we offer so instead of this old dichotomy of there being the creative class and the non-creators or there being, you know, the people who are only suitable for working and then the people who are suitable for kind of creating the jobs. And, you know, this is, goes back mm-hmm. to this very old fashioned idea of, of the overclass and the you know underclass. And if anything, I, I don't see necessarily money changing, but I see the, the changing tide from moving towards a, from a very strategic competitive style towards one where we're all resources and we can choose to make those resources available to others or not and we cultivate and develop our our own resources and so it is very much uh instead of thinking simply how do i survive or how do i what's my best strategy for acquiring wealth you know because that's the other thing is um it, it does there's a very interesting question around our relationship to our needs, our desires and our needs, you know? <laughs> and uh, there's such a promise of if that money can be a stand-in for desire, that money can get you what you desire. And if you have more money, you can have your desires. But I think as people become aware of, and I do think this is happening. I think that the internet is a large part of this and just the kind of seeing behind so many curtains. I mean, there's very much, it's like Scorpio. veils are yeah, veils are being just pulled away by the by the day. And as we see behind those veils, we you know we see collectively, maybe even at, at the Aquarius level also that there are these um it's just that that to to be strategic and to compete for resources in the name of trying to get infinite money for infinite desire is not is not what it's all about and even people who, who have been extremely successful and and who are extremely wealthy because there's so much visibility into each other's lives now there's very much uh, a desire to do something with that and to change to change the world in some way and I, I see that it's you know right. it's, there's less of it's we are moving past a, a sort of feudalistic worldview where we have to tightly hold on to resources and, and we're starting to share those resources more and um, so it's it's an interesting time and place to be alive we're, we're definitely seeing um, a lot of shifts in terms of how people experience experience wealth and resources and their relationship to their own desires and and what and their needs as well um, do you have any ideas about how um, new attitudes towards money or particularly, you know, um, I mean, I'm just thinking around how there have been these, these changes with the kind of major planetary cycles that have continued to happen. And this probably the the largest one that I, in my lifetime is, was in in the uh, nineties with the Uranus Neptune conjunction. And it seems like we're still feeling the effects of that or we've still we've entered into this new age that we haven't quite fully made sense of um, in many ways and and with the internet in particular it seems like there's just been this explosion of um, new avenues for reaching people for connecting for sharing resources for for making money in all different ways that didn't exist before i mean the ways that weren't even even imaginable i've been seeing a shift as well with pluto and capricorn I mean, I think Pluto and Capricorn has been um, unveiling some of the corruption within, you know, like big business, oligarchy, that kind of 
you know, big structural power. Um, and it's also been calling other people forward to, you know, become empowered and share their resources and gifts with the world. Um, there's a sense that we were taught early on that business is kind of dirty and like, you know, business people lie and that's how you make money is you do all these wrong things. Um, and there was a sense even maybe of apathy coming after that of like, oh, I shouldn't be a professional or join the world because that's for corrupt people. So there's this new, you know, reimagining of what it means to be professional with Pluto and Capricorn. And, you know, sometimes it's very real and authentic. And other times it's just a matter of image and branding, like putting on a sticker that, you know, is like, I'm green, you know, therefore I'm, uh, you know, you can feel good about buying this product. And, you know, sometimes that's backed up and other times it's just an illusion. And so it is kind of, you know, this, I think, seeking to become more aware of the ethics of power when it comes to Pluto and Capricorn and the way that, um, you know, do we want to run our world with money at the bottom line as just a basic compulsion and addiction? Or do we want to create value and let money follow? There's a difference about going into business with the desire to make money. And I feel like it's it doesn't really work that well anymore. And then the desire to create something valuable. And so that's what all the spiritual uh, resources and self-help books and entrepreneur books about business are going to say is like, do what you love and the money follows. Um, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've seen it firsthand uh, where, you know, I live here in Seattle, which is one of these kind of tech, tech uh, capitals along with Silicon Valley. And I've seen that... Um, it goes more than more than just just rhetoric um, that people get fed up working at a company where they don't feel that they're creating actual value and part of the proliferation of so many startups and, and internet services it is not simply to make money I mean that that can be one of the kind of claims made about it oh these are people just trying to trying to make money but and I'm sure that happens in some cases but I would say in my experience, having known a number of people who've made startups and, and having been involved in that community myself, that a lot of times, or in fact, the vast majority of the times, it's because people really want to create something worthwhile and they want to create something valuable to others. And if the money follows, it does, but it, it really is about, it's, it's the shift from strategizing to maximize profit towards developing a resource that's actually solving people's problems or helping them in some way or making their lives better. And I, I do think that that is a, a crucial shift that's happened. And in a way, it's maybe come full circle where traditionally that's that's been a major part of how humanity has developed it going back to the pre, pre-industrial pre times of being a, a kind of an, an artisan or, or doing things that you love through this apprenticeship to, towards mastery and the, the and, and learning a trade and learning all of these things. And then with the industrial era, in some ways, I mean, obviously we're in the peak of the industrial era, but but in some ways we're also the beginning of the, the post-industrial era where, where we are kind of moving beyond the, the consciousness that simply wants to mass produce. And you start to see that mass production has a lot of benefits and it's allowed us to get here, but it's it's also it has its costs in terms of the environmental impact. And um, there's shocking statistics, you know, 90% of the books that are published, books that are made with trees, you know, 90% end up in landfills unread because the publisher just publishes massive amounts of books hoping they'll get sold and it's cheaper for them to have too many than, you know, not enough. And then, so we enter, we, we, or it's like that across the board. I mean, how many computer chips end up in landfills because they were made for a one year cycle and so on. And there's a real burgeoning awareness of this. And I, I think in some ways it is a really nice return to um, an appreciation of the individual effort to create something worthwhile for others and the, the love that goes into the creation of resources for others and services for others. It's, we're moving towards a, 
a notion of services and, and being of service to people. And, and, right. You know. And I could see it coming full circle, another layer of money being like something that can be valued versus something that is intrinsically kind of dirty or you know money has so many psychic entanglements with it because of its history of being the source of an addiction that created negative behavior and compulsion scorpio so because you know of in the name of money people do bad things therefore money's bad but money is just a symbol and there's something you know happening deeper and so when it gets to a point where money is disentangled from that, people might be more comfortable with being engineering and creating businesses and new structures in society that are really valuable in an objective way and make money instead of there being this dichotomy of money can only be made dishonestly. And if I really do what's valuable, I'm going to, you know, kind of be poor while I'm doing it. Um, you know, where can we sync these two concepts together of value but, you know, real value and money, which is a symbol of power and freedom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can have power and freedom for doing what's valuable. I don't have to. And this is a scorpionic storyline of empowerment. There's a phase along the track of empowerment where people do things that I guess are unsavory to extract or get the thing that they're obsessed with instead of realizing that there's a, you know, a better way to go about it but still have the end result, that feeling of what it is they were trying to get, um, just coming into a magnetic um, relationship with it where they don't have to do things <laughs> that are, yeah. Well, and maybe the cure for that obsession is, a, is, because we're talking scorpionic themes, has to do with the need for Taurus to come in with, with its patience. You know, Taurus <laughs> can, be, can be famously patient. Patience and tenderness. Hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, this is all fascinating. I've really appreciated having this talk today. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about about what you do um, when you're not when you're not talking like this? <laughs> I don't talk like this. So sure. I mean, what I do with astrology? Yeah. Well, yeah. And and you have a website and you have a, a weekly forecast. Right, it's monarchastrology.com, and I write weekly forecasts, and they're very psychological and philosophical. Um, and you have a Patreon campaign. Right, I'm writing a book um, about a variety of spiritual principles that can accelerate an awareness of how to contact the beyond, because I think that astrology isn't just a matter of learning about the archetypes and techniques, though that's a huge part of it, it's also about conditioning the consciousness to, you know, know how to pray and hear answers, um, to contact higher mind, the collective database of human information, um, to know what the soul is, and to get into these, you know, spiritual or seemingly esoteric concepts. But I'm working to deconstruct them and break them down and, you know, demystify these very mystical things so that you know, people can um, experiment with their prayers, for example, and see how they might contact the unknown and receive answers, which I think can all be really valuable for having a personal astrology practice. So that, um, you know, one thing I write about in the book is the difference between the ephemeral, the temporary, and the ultimate. And just, you know, how making this distinction can really alter one's life and really expand um, just one's experience of the spiritual dimension where before there's some kind of placeholder like you know this thing that I value is God to me and it becomes ultimate when it's an ephemeral quality absolutely absolutely so I'm just really excited to to share these ideas absolutely and I'm excited uh, as well because I do have a personal I mean, when you say personal astrology practice, you mean, you know, a, a personal relationship to the transits and to your own chart and how it, it connects with other people. And um, that's very much, um, I mean, I, I, I do feel like, you know, anyone who really um, 
gets excited about about these areas of thought, you know, be, starts they become a student of the stars, and they become a student where the teachers are in many ways the transits themselves, or the the transpersonal forces that that you connect with that are, yeah, in some ways it is going beyond the ephemeral and and part of the great comfort that can happen during a time of crisis is to be able to look at you know some of the things that that you valued so strongly or that are and as you said kind of elevated to a godlike status and realizing that there there is something else at work and that there's a a far greater picture that that we can be a part of and it's not even just a one-sided thing we we participate with it and the more we engage with it the more the more our relationship changes with it our life experiences change as well and and we begin to experience things internally and and not necessarily experience them only as fate or only as something that happens to us and um, i'm really looking forward to to reading your your book and uh i'm very excited about that project thank you thank you well said all right well thank you for listening to all our listeners out there and uh I hope that this has been an informative and interesting talk. Thank you. Thanks.